Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing uh, the discussion of um, theories, and I'm going to go into more depth um, with respect to the role of um, um, revisionist histories. Um, in particular, there's a concept that comes out of German thought. Um, you have to forgive me if I mispronounce this. It's called Vergangenheis Bewetigung. Vergangenheis Bewetigung. Um, and the idea of Vergangenheis Bewetigung is going to be discussed. I, I'm not going to say that word anymore. I'm just going to call it dealing with the past, right? That's the American translation, or the English rather, translation, dealing with the past. So I'm going to um, continue the discussion on revisionist history and this notion of dealing with the past. Um, so with that, let's begin. Theories, and we're still um, we're still in section, and I'm gonna have to put a new section title here. So section actually, actually, are we in? I'm in section one, and I'll label it for my. I'll just call it uh, one point one. Okay, so we're in section um, one point one of the notes, at the bottom of page uh, three. So it's a section. Okay, um, so this term, I'll just write it once, V-E-R-G-A-N-G-E-N-H-E-I-S-T-B-E-W-A-L-T-I-G-U-N-G, that's a big word, <laughs> this means dealing with the past. Um, it means dealing with the past. And what the author did um, is to incorporate this, this notion of dealing with the past and make a correlation to um, the American slave trade, North American slave trade. Um, so in order to understand the, the progress of the discussion, we're going to see how the um, United States of America in particular dealt with um, and more generally speaking, how the dominant class, those in control of the status quo, deal with opposition to the historical narrative, you know, counter-narratives to the dominant discourse, right? How is it that those with power deal um, with counter-narratives, right? So we'll incorporate some of that discussion. So the first thing to recognize in this idea of dealing with the past is that um, racist orthodoxy, right, as the majority, creates the condition for historical oppression. So racist orthodoxy, orthodoxy, x, y, racist orthodoxy creates the condition for historical repression, R, E, right? Racist orthodoxy is the antecedent cause, or one of the antecedent causes for historical repression. And by historical repression, what we're saying is that the narratives from those individuals that have been oppressed um, are suppressed, repressed by the dominant discourse, right? So that this becomes um, a corollary with the dominant discourse, right? Racist orthodoxy becomes the dominant discourse. And this discourse, right, this dominant discourse is in place to repress the narrative of those who are oppressed. So the whole point of the dominant discourse is to continually oppress the oppressed, right? right? So the dominant discourse, this racist orthodoxy, is set in motion to oppress the oppressed people, right? And what ends up happening in, in a Ferrarian sense is that liberation theory, right? Liberation theory, Right? Liberation theory comes as a consequence of this oppression. Right? So the dominant discourses oppress the oppressed, and as a consequence of this oppression, the oppressed attempt to um, create this counter narrative, right? This counter narrative to their oppression. So, for example, um, there was the belief that uh, African Americans were were um, violent, right, inherently, that African Americans 
were um, stupid inherently, right? So the oppressed people, if the oppressed people we're looking at are African Americans, recognize that this discourse, right, this dominant discourse is in place to oppress them, right? So you say African Americans are ignorant, African Americans are stupid, African Americans are lazy. Once we recognize the, the function of the dominant discourse, it's the obligation of the oppressed people to create a counter-narrative, right, a, this liberation theory to that dominant discourse, right, and thus liberate themselves from the confines of that discourse. So what ends up happening is um, we need to, in a sense, deal with the past, right? We need to deal, as a nation, as a country, need to deal with the past, and that past is obviously a, pa a past deeply rooted in um, slavery and segregation, right? So we went from a progression from um, actual slavery, right, and, and the enslave, enslavement of people, and later in the video series I'll talk more about um, sort of more acute concepts with respect to how this idea morphs into segregation, but we go from slavery to this idea of um, institutionalized, legalized segregation. Um, and now we're at a point where we still need to, not necessarily rage, rage against, as the oppressed people, rage against slavery, but we still need to rage against um, institutionalized segregation, right? And no one really does this in my terms, in my, in my assessment, better than Kozel. Jonathan Kozel, um, famous educational theorist, talks about um, the, the still pervasive existence of segregation within our educational system, right? Appropriation of funds, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But there is a dominant discourse, and we as um, oppressed people have the obligation to create this counter-narrative to the dominant discourse, right? So the oppressed create this counter-narrative out of this liberation theory, right? And I've already done videos uh, extensively on sort of the structure in which this unfolds in my series on um, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So the next point is um, the new revisionist accounts of history are posed by anti-racist minorities, right? The minorities in the sense of non-majority, non-orthodoxy, right? So this dominant discourse, as we've seen, is a racist, becomes a racist discourse, right? So this discourse is inherently racist, right? And what ends up happening is that the people who are targeted by this racist discourse need to create, in their liberation theory, an anti They need to create an anti-racist discourse, right? So you have this this um, oppositional um, sort of this oppo oppositional um, nature within the dialogue, if you want to call it that, between the dominant discourse and this new emerging um, anti-racist discourse, right? The obligation to create this anti-racist discourse is obviously the obligation of those who are oppressed by the dominant discourse, right? Women, homosexuals, minorities, um, um, foreigners have the obligation for, for, for obvious reasons of, of responding to this dominant racist or dominant, dominant patriarchal discourse that is, that is enacted to oppress, right? The, the function of the discourse is um, to oppress. Okay, on uh, page four again, next bullet point is historical memory itself becomes segregated, right? And this idea comes from uh, W.E.B. Dubois. Dubois talks about this in uh, Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880, right? So in um, Black Reconstruction in America, Dubois talks about the segregation of historical memory. That's a very technical concept, I'll, I'll, uh, and that's why I illustrated it, to make sure that the concept's understood. Um, because I've read, you know, a few articles where, to my understanding, it wasn't, it wasn't actually clearly described. Um, so I want to take the time to make sure that we understand what this um, segregation in historical memory, what that means. Okay, so let's look at that. Okay, so in dealing with the past, we have to, first thing is that in dealing with the past, we have to address our shared this is important, historical memory, right? In dealing with the past, um, regarding heist verbatigung, right? In dealing with the past, we have to address our shared historical memory. Dubois says in um, Black Reconstruction in America, our historical memory becomes itself segregated. And the question obviously becomes, what does Dubois mean by 
Když se 